It was a fine day, thank goodness, when I took my nephew Keith for his first visit to Liverpool. And for me, a welcome opportunity to revisit my native city. Do you know Liverpool well, Uncle Derek? Well, I know my way around pretty well, yes. Come on. This is a big ferry boat, isn't it? Yes, fairly big. But some of them carry 2,000 passengers. Shall we see some big ships? Oh, I think we're almost sure to. We're passing a ship now. Hurry up, Keith. Oh, it's the, um, Palato. Paleo? Isn't she smashing, Uncle? Yes, look up there. That's the ship's radar, used for navigation. Oh. There's another one twirling round. Where? That one, over there. Oh, yes. That's the port radar. It was the first in the world. Is that a tanker? No, it's a dredger. It may help to clean the channel of sand and mud. Look, there's the pier head. Do the big liners sail from just along here? That's right. That was a Cunada. I think this one is an elder Dempster ship, probably going to West Africa. What shall we do first when we land? Well, there's lots of things to do, Keith. Um, we'll take a bus trip through the city. This way. What's that place on the right? The Mersey Docks and Harbour Board Office. Controls the docks and the dredges we saw. Gosh, what a big bell. Mm, certainly is. Is that a church? No, one of the Mersey Tunnel ventilating shafts. Come on, Keith, hurry up, come on. There's the overhead railway in front. What are those arches? The Gorey. What are they used for? West African warehouses in the old days. What's that place just ahead, Uncle? The town hall. It's the official headquarters of the city. This is Dale Street. It leads to the Mersey Tunnel. Shall we see the tunnel? We'll be there any minute now. There's St. George's Hall. What do they do then? Oh, the Royal Courts and a concert hall. Oh, here's the tunnel entrance. How long is it? Over two miles. What's that? The Philharmonic Hall. How high is the cathedral? I don't know. Will this cathedral be higher? I don't know. How old is the university? I really don't know. What's that? Who built that? What's that? Where? Why? Where? 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 What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? Oh. What a boy. Now to find some of the answers. Like most Liverpudlians, I had never been inside the town hall, so I decided to start there. Going up the grand staircase, the Lord Mayor's butler said, walk this way, please. And I nearly replied, well, I couldn't walk that way if he paid me whack. Afterwards, I went down to the silver room, where I met Mr. Tinnick. So all this silver is in your charge, Mr. Tinnick? Yes, Tinnick's. it's uh, my job to look after the town hall silver. Mm -hmm. It's a full-time job, too. I'm sure it is. I mean, looking round and seeing all these pieces, I'm sure it must keep you very, very busy. I suppose, um, I suppose they're very valuable, aren't they? Oh, yes, some very valuable pieces. Mm. Well, now, I I'd like you to tell me about one, two things here. What, what is this? That's one of my favourites. It's a snuff box. 1690 is the date. 1690? Snuff box, enormous size, isn't it? Yes. That's a tanker, of course. Oh, yes, eh? that's the, uh, the oldest piece we have. 1683. 1683. Mm, it is an old piece. Uh, what, no beer? Well, I'd fill it with beer. I'd never get it clean. <laughs> <laughs> but we use these uh, regularly. Mm -hmm. 
Eating sugar tabs, the lovely thing, aren't they? They're very 18, pretty. 20. 18, 20. Yes, yes, they're very, very pretty, aren't they? Well, where does this, uh, where does this collection come from? Uh, does the corporation buy all these individual pieces? Oh, no. It's, uh, they're given by Lord Mayors on retiring from their year of office. Oh, I see. So they're nearly all presentation, are they? Well, some of your Lord Mayors must have had very good taste. Well, I must ask you this. Uh, have any of these pieces ever been stolen? Oh, yes. The lot was taken by Rupert in the war. What, the whole lot? Yes. Rupert? Well, which war? The Civil War. Oh, the Civil War. Oh, I see. Well, then, I suppose, what, what happened then? You... Oh, we had to start all over start again. Start all over again. Well, I must say, you've made a magnificent job of starting all over again. Very, very lovely, yes. But, you know, that's the one that really fascinates me. Oh, the ship. Mm. I'll get it for you. Oh, well, look, I'll move these things out of the way. And then you will have room to put it down. That's it. It's a model of a 17th century Dutch ship. Yes, it's very lovely. Have you had it long? We've only had it about a couple of years. Mm -hmm. It had to take the bottle of wine in here. I see, that's most unusual, isn't it? Yes, most unusual. It's lovely. We're going to use it for a dinner to a civic party from Copenhagen this week. Oh, yes. I suppose you have quite a lot of important business moves. Oh, yes, days. we do. You ought to see the table when it's set for dinner. It looks very well. We often use this as a centerpiece. I see, with some yes. of these small things round it. Round the sides, yes. It must look very lovely. That is a very beautiful piece. Yes, it really it is, is. indeed. Later, I saw the ship on the gleaming mahogany surface of the dining table upstairs. Places were set for dinner, and although only a small part of the civic silver was being used, I noticed that each piece had its exact place. Not there. Here. So. The flowers, particularly the orchids, were magnificent. I discovered they were grown in the city's own nurseries at Sudley Park, and there I met Mr. Dalgleish. You're a specialist, Mr. Dalgleish. Yes, that's uh, orchids in my line. I've been at them all my life, and so has my father before me. Are they used for exhibition or for decoration, say, in the town hall? Well, uh, they're used for a uh, decoration in the town hall and also on exhibition in the various parks for sh on show to the public. We also put a few in for on show at uh, Liverpool show. Of course we've got uh, quite a variety. There's this one here which is uh, a spider orchid, Brassia varicosa. We have another one there, which is the moth orchid, uh, Palaenopsis amabilis. And then, of course, we have the old Cypripedium, which is a good standby. When cut, that'll last for a couple of uh, months. From Sudley, I went across to Calderstones, the headquarters of the Corporation Parks Department. Behind the scenes in the nursery, the staff were busy. For, as the seasons change, they must maintain a steady flow of plants to the city gardens in the heart of Liverpool. There's always a pageant of colour and fragrance in this park, and I realised that you can only achieve such harmony by careful planning and patient skill. I thought that even I could produce a lovely garden if bedding plants were delivered regularly in a plain van. But perhaps you still need a good bedside manner. Everyone in Liverpool knows the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board building. But I wanted to know more about the work of the board, so I called on Captain Colbeck. 
and the marine surveyor. Captain Colvick, it's very kind of you and your colleagues to see me. I understand that you three gentlemen are responsible for keeping the channel clear and uh, seeing that the boats come safely into harbour. Is that uh, roughly how it might be put? Um, broadly speaking, Mr. Guyler, that is correct. Yes. The, um, my particular responsibility is the buoying and lighting, hydrographic survey, removal of wrecks and obstructions, and radar and communications. Yes. Uh, Captain Hamilton is responsible for dredging, and Mr. Fulton, as a senior Mersey pilot, is representative of the pilots who enable the vessels to come safely in and out of the port. Yes, thank you. And I understand that the, uh, the channel is very long, is that right? Well, we have some 30 miles of channel through narrow sand banks, a large areas of which have to be dredged. Oh, yes. But um, I think Captain Hamilton can explain that in more detail than I can. Thank you. Down here, is the bar light ship. Oh yes, I see. Oh, I've sailed past the bar many times. Now, this is the bar which there is now 25 feet of water maintained by dredging. Oh yes. Uh, dredging, we found, was not sufficient for to keep the channel clear. Therefore, we had to build these two revetment walls extending pretty well way up to New Brighton. Yes, and that stops the sand falling back into the channel which you already dredged. Yes. yes. Well, this, our job is to uh, keep the channels clear and to keep the revetment walls maintained to the respective heights. Yes. Which requires quite a large uh, fleet. Mm -hmm. And we have, uh, with the, the Sandfront dredge is one of the largest dredges in the world, the Leviathan. I think you can see now. She isn't a spectacular craft, but then her job is unspectacular, though vital to the working of the port. After all, Liverpool's biggest export is sand, which is dumped in the Irish Sea. Captain Hamilton's department dredges and maintains the walls, and uh, Captain Colbeck surveys, lights and boys the channel. But what I want to know, Mr. Fulton, is uh, where do the pilots come in? Well, that appears to be a very fair question, Mr. Garver. The points you mentioned are mostly controlled by man, whereas the major part of a pilot's duty is concerned with natural difficulties such as wind, weather, current and excessive tide. Yes. Therefore, you will appreciate that uh, a pilot must have a detailed knowledge of local conditions together with the constant liaison which obtains between the pilotage, the marine surveyor's department, and uh, the dredging department, yes, yes, yes. in order to handle the shipping of the port. Yes, quite. Of course, you will realize that pilots on inward duty commence their work a long way from here. We maintain a pilot boat at Point Linus, off the north coast of Anglesey, which maintains a constant patrol day and night in order to serve the vessels entering the port. There are four pilot boats, like the Grotto Bank, between them maintaining the constant patrol at the bar and at Point Linus. They each carry a complement of qualified pilots who take their turn in boarding ships as they arrive. Some of the leading shipping lines have their own designated pilots, but in most cases, the duty pilot takes whatever ship may come. In good weather, boarding is easy. On a dark night, in a gale, it isn't quite so easy. Once on board, the pilot makes his way to the bridge and greets the captain. The ship then continues on her way to Liverpool with the pilot now in charge of the navigation. The pilotage pennant is run up to indicate to all seafarers in the time-honored way that the Liverpool pilot is aboard. These men are licensed by the dock board, which is the pilotage authority for the port. 
pilots themselves are directly represented on the board's pilotage committee. Meanwhile, 50 miles away from the duty pilot boat, one of the pilots has arrived off Gladstone Dock and is preparing to bring the Empress of Scotland to her berth. Although the master and pilot are responsible for the safety of the ship, much depends on the dock master, who controls her passage through the entrance lock. Under the orders of the dock master, gangs of men help to warp the ship through the lock, while by a shouted order or whistled signal, the escorting tugs keep the liner straight and with just enough way on her to make her manageable. Officer. There's no fuss and no excitement. It's just a beautiful piece of teamwork by men on the ship and on the quay, who all know their jobs. But for every liner in Liverpool docks, you will see a score of freighters. Some of their cargoes are impressive and obvious. Others are less obvious. This one, for example, is from one of Liverpool's own industrial estates. Out at Speak, I saw what it contained. Water. This machine sterilizes medical ampules by the thousand. It fills them with distilled water and seals them. They are then exported for use in hospitals all over the world. In contrast, heavier industry can be found at speed. Tires for all kinds of vehicles, buses, bicycles, tractors and taxis. They aren't only a valuable export, but vast numbers are needed by British motorists, including racing men, who now have a new international circuit at Aintree. It was a typical English summer day when Lord Howe opened the new track which runs alongside the famous Grand National Course. Even without the jumps, the new track seemed as difficult as the National, as the drivers skidded round the curves on the wet surface. Although perhaps slower, the traffic in the Mersey Tunnel is also much safer, for there is no danger of skidding here. But there are other risks which must be guarded against. For example, the exhaust gases from thousands of cars. When I saw the analyzer, which measures the carbon monoxide in the tunnel every nine seconds, I realized the precautions taken. Directly the dial registers in excess of fumes. Action is taken by an engineer in the control room, the nerve center of the entire Mersey tunnel. Additional fans are switched on, or their speed increased, in all the ventilating tiles. Some of these huge fans are 28 feet across and 9 feet thick. As the fan speed increases, more foul air is drawn out through the roof of the tunnel and clean fresh air is pumped through vents under the roadway from each of the six ventilating tiles, while the foul air is dispersed high above. On the way up from the pier head, one passes one of the worst blitz areas in the city centre. Here, in the old days, were many well-known shops including Frisbee Dykes, a name that somehow still seems familiar. 
I noticed that new gardens had been laid out here and that a considerable amount of rebuilding was going on. I knew that the city's redevelopment committee had replanned the center of the city and had models of the shape of things to come. So I called on the city engineer and surveyor to ask about the planning of this area. Yes, this is the place I was looking at. You, you call that the Lord Street Blitz area, don't you? Yes, and it's one of the largest Blitz central areas in the country. Mm -hmm. It's about 46 acres in extent. And uh, in 1941, after almost a year of bombing, we regarded this as a catastrophe. Yes, I see. But now, it's an opportunity. For example, here is the scheme for this area. This is the proposed bus station and a helicopter landing place. These are proposed offices. And here is a row of shops. Uh, this is the garden that you have already seen. And this building is already in course of erection. And I do know that many of these other buildings will be started quite soon. I'm beginning to realize that 20 years is quite a short time for the planner. Yes, indeed. This is a 20-year scheme. But over here I have a model which shows a scheme which will not be completed for 100 years. Oh. And here it is, the Metropolitan Cathedral. And we know that it, it will take at least 100 years to complete. Within half a mile of the Metropolitan Cathedral site stands the Anglican Cathedral on St. James's Mount. Begun half a century ago, the chancel, central tower and transepts have been completed, but the nave has still to be built. Work is slowly going forward on this tremendous scheme, and already the first bays of the nave are standing. A unique company of craftsmen for some of them have labored here all their working lives, are cutting and carving the immense blocks of red sandstone, quarried a few miles away at Walton. With all the painstaking skill and precision of experts, each block of stone is cut and shaped. Every finished piece is allotted a number, then carefully raised and fitted into the complex pattern of the mighty columns and arches. And so this cathedral is being built in the historic tradition, slowly, but with infinite care, and the work, which has gone on for 50 years, will require a further 20 to reach completion. From the cathedral tower, the Liver building, housing England's largest clock, dominates the view. This familiar clock has a far from familiar inside story. Looking round the clock house, Surprisingly, no bell is visible in this central space, so obviously designed for one. There are four conventional clock movements, one for each dial, all of which are controlled by a small master clock. But here's the unexpected difference. This exciter mechanism completes a circuit and actuates these tiny striking hammers whose tinkling sounds are enormously amplified. Mr. Baddeley, who is in charge of the clock, shows how compact the electronic device is. Now watch the whole of this unique striking system as the hour is struck.
varying by no more than two seconds each week, the huge clock above the Mersey ticks on. And perhaps it is time to go in search of tones even more musical than the chimes. The Philharmonic Hall is the home of Liverpool's famous orchestra. But in the summer season, the public for the promenade concerts is so great that performances are held in the boxing stadium, which seats more than 4,000. One afternoon, I went into the Philharmonic to hear an orchestral rehearsal. They were playing Elgar's Cocaine Overture. Let's go back to um, figure 27. Brass, not quite so heavy there. We'll let the second fiddle through a little bit. Not quite so heavy. Seconds play out, huh? A little more. You don't get it, huh? 27 now. Let's try it. <laughs> Here in the boxing stadium, Elgar's tribute to London town seems to express the spirit of Liverpool. In the city streets, the same scurry and bustle of traffic and people is to be seen. The businessmen in the offices and exchanges deal with distant capitals and realize, as many do not, that Britain is an island which must trade or perish. But this is a city of many trades. Some jobs demand strength as well as skill. Others require incessant concentration. Some are spectacular, exciting and even dangerous. Others call for dedicated intent. Men perform marvels of painstaking dexterity. Women exercise confident authority. And boys ask questions. A quiet and undemonstrative people, you say? Quiet. Careful on them stairs, like it. To me, it's a place of fascinating contrasts. Even on Sundays, the boom of ship sirens mingles with the sound of church bells. For on weekday or Sabbath, the port is never still. The people have the sea in their blood and are familiar with far horizons. There always seems to be a fresh breeze blowing in from the west. Liverpool's main street is the Mersey, and it goes on to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. 